So we know some of the geometric properties of dot and cross product and how they can be used to do things like find the uh, angle between two vectors or to find the normal, the, the uh, direction vector of a normal of a plane, things like that. But outside of pure math, what are the applications of dot and cross product? And there are some actually very useful ones. So this page is essentially just a summary of all the different ways that we could use in this course, uh, dot product and cross product. So you'll notice the first, the first two uh, rows there are just the definitions of dot and cross product. We already know this, like this is what dot product is, it's just you multiply the x terms, you multiply the y terms. Um, cross product, this is just essentially what it is, we know how to do that. And we also know the algebraic calculation. So an equivalent statement to a dot b is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle between those vectors. And a similar one applies for cross product. But the, the only big difference between dot and cross product is that cross product gives you a vector when you do it, right? It gives you a normal vector to the two original vectors. So in order to use this calculation, we just need to do the magnitude of a cross b will, will be equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times sine theta, because this is just a number. This is just gonna come up to a number, right? So it wouldn't make sense to have a vector over here. So those two relationships are useful. And one of the main ways we use these two things is in physics. Um, if you've taken a physics cl you, class, you probably know what work is, and you probably have some idea of what torque is. And in physics class, they're, they actually look very similar to each other. So what work is, first of all, work is defined as, in physics, it's defined as a force applied over a distance. So what I mean by that is if you have a box that you're going to push along the ground with, say, 120 newtons of force, and that box moves, say, 10 meters, the amount of work that you do is just the force times the distance. This is the equation we usually use in physics. Work equals force times the change in displacement or the distance. So in this case, pretty straightforward, it would just be 120 newtons times 10 meters, which gives us an answer of 120 times 10 is 1200, and the unit for work is joules. It's the same as the unit for energy. Work and energy are very closely related. So in physics, this is the formula we often use. Now, you'll notice this is under the dot product section. And the reality is your physics teacher lied to you a little bit. This actually isn't the definition of what work is. It isn't force times distance. It is actually equal to the force vector dot product dot producted with the position vector or the displacement vector. I just use S here instead of D because your textbook uses S for position. So work, again, is the force vector times the displacement vector. So basically when we have this, when we have a simple situation like this, notice how the force vector is an arrow like that that has a length of 120 and the displacement vector is an arrow like that that's um, 10 meters long, right? So if this is our force and this is our displacement, in this case the answer is correct. It's not like the answer is wrong, but the reason is because the dot product of those two things are just going to equal 1200 joules. So this is very simple if you're working with directions and forces um, that are in the same direction. It gets a little bit more complicated otherwise. And the the case that gets a little bit more complicated is if you have a box and you want to move it 10 meters along the ground, 10 meters, that's 10, 10 meters along the ground, but the force you apply is not in that same direction. So say you're, you're, you know, you're a tall person pulling this box along the floor with a rope attached to it. So you're actually pulling the box a little bit upwards. So now the displacement vector and the force vector are in different directions. And in physics, you might've learned a formula for that too. But notice how it's very similar to this equation here. So we can say that work, because work we know is just the dot product of the force and the displacement. So we can actually replace this equation with the magnitude of the force vector 
times the magnitude of the displacement vector times cos theta, where theta is the angle between those two vectors, right? So these two formulas, force dot displacement, or the magnitude of force times the magnitude of displacement, cos theta, are going to be useful to us. And same as with dot product, if we want to choose which one to use, if we're given just the magnitudes of the vectors and the angle between them, use this one. If we're given the actual vectors, like by components, we can use this one, right? So let's just jump down to the bottom. Let's do a quick example of this, or to the next page, I should say. You're pulling a sled with a force of 150 newtons at an angle of 40 degrees with the ground. So let's pretend this is a sled, just drawing a rectangle, and you're moving it um, 50 meters. And the angle you make with the force when you're pulling it is 40 degrees, and the force is 150 newtons. So we know Basically, we have two vectors here, and the displacement vector, I'm just going to draw it as a vector, as an arrow, but that's it's basically that 50 meters, right? So we want to find, essentially, the dot product of these two vectors. So which equation do you think is easier to use? Well, notice how we're given the magnitudes of both vectors, and we're given the angle between them. And this is going to be the case with most physics problems having to do with, um, having to do with work. You're going to be given these things. You're not going to be given the vectors in components, but though you may. So in any case, work is equal to, we know it's going to be the magnitude of the force vector times the magnitude of the position vector, displacement vector, cos of the angle between them. So we can just literally plug in those things. The magnitude of the force vector, well, that's just the number involved with the force vector, so 150 newtons. The uh, magnitude of the position vector or the displacement vector which is just 50 meters and then cosine of the angle between them which is just 40 degrees so clearly we're working with degrees here and most of the times we're working with physics we are working in degrees um, unless it says otherwise and if you do that on your calculator you should get a work output of 5,000 about 5,745 joules. I'll put a little dot for approximately. I'm just going to round to the nearest whole number there. So about that many joules, which is true. Okay, so that's that's all there is to it. It's not complicated. It's basically the same thing you'd be doing in a physics class. We're just thinking about it in a slightly different way and using slightly different notation. So the next physics application of cross product is torque. Now, before I talk about torque, I'm gonna I'm gonna write the equation that you might do in physics for torque. So torque, what torque is, is a rotating force. And the equation that you might so basically anything that's spinning has some torque or is able to apply some torque, or to spin anything, you need to apply torque to it. So basically, um, the most common example, well, one of the most common examples is if you have a bolt, right, and you want to rotate that bolt, you take a, you take a wrench, right, and what you do is you apply a force to that wrench away from the center of that wrench. It's going to spin around this point. You apply a force to that wrench to rotate it, and that's called a torque. And the equation you might have learned for torque is force times distance. Wait a minute. Isn't that exactly the same as work, force times distance? It looks almost exactly the same. And in a lot of ways, it is similar. But in a lot of ways, it's actually very different. Because what I mean here by the torque is that it's the force that's applied to sort of the handle of this wrench. So we'll call this, this is the F. And then the distance is the distance away from the center of that object. In fact, it's the perpendicular distance away from the center of that object. So it's different because you're not pushing something along the ground, you're rotating it. So it's, it is closely related to work, but it's different. We call it different. And in fact, the units we use for it. So for example, if this wrench, we would apply 100 newtons. Let's say we apply 100 newtons. 
and this is like 0 0.3 meters. The length of the wrench is 0.3 meters, or about a foot. It's a long wrench. Um, what you're going to get for the torque is that the torque is going to be the force, which is 100 newtons times 0 0.3 meters, which is going to give you 30 newton meters, right? Now, the interesting thing here is that I'm going to use newton meters as the units because we're multiplying newtons and meters and not joules. And that's one of the ways we differentiate between torque and work is that here we use the units, units newton meters or an imperial. You might have heard of foot pounds. Foot pounds is also a unit of torque because it's feet times pounds, which is the unit of force. So very similar idea in physics. But when you take a look at the math behind it, it's actually more different than it may seem. Because, again, your teacher lied to you if they told you this was the equation for, for torque. What torque actually is, is it's the cross product of the force vector and the displacement vector. That's how it's fundamentally different from work. Um, the reasons behind that are reasons we can get into. If you have questions about that, you can ask me. Um, but for this video, all you need to know is that torque is actually equal to the um, the cross product of the displacement vector and the force vector. Also, notice here how your textbook uses R for the displacement vector. And the reason why um, it uses R is because you can sort of think of it as a radius, right? When you're spinning something um, around a point, it's like you're, you're spinning it. The distance you are spinning it is the radius away from the center. So that's why they call it R. Um, but all it means is distance from the center to the force. So the we can actually, again, in this case, so this is our definition of torque, right? It's the magnitude of those two things. Or we can express it as, as you see above, the distance, the magnitude of the distance times the magnitude of the force times sine of the angle between those vectors, okay? So let's see how this plays out in an example. To turn a bolt, a 50 Newton force is applied, force is applied to a wrench that's 40 centimeters long. Um, the force is applied an angle of 30 degrees to the wrench. So first of all, this doesn't really look like a wrench, but you can picture the wrench sort of like this, right? And there's the handle, okay? So this is the bolt down here, okay? So the radius, we know the radius is 40 centimeters long, right? And we know the force is 50 newtons. We can label this to 40 centimeters. I'm actually going to convert it to meters too, because usually we do newton meters as our units of torque. So that's 0 0.4 meters, right? Now, it says that the force is applied an angle of 30 degrees to the wrench. So where is that 30 degrees? Well, we can consider the wrench is like along this line here, right? Or our, radi our vector. Our vector is on that line. So the angle is going to be this 30 degrees in here. So that's what it always is. The angle that you're given, that you use in the equation, is the angle between the two vectors. So you can think of the r vector as this, like extending. The angle between those two vectors is the 30 degrees. You do not use this angle in here. You do not use that. Okay? All right. So anyways, our definition of torque, we know it's going to be the magnitude of the distance between those, the force and the center of rotation, and the magnitude of the force vector times sine of the angle between them, and that's all you do. So the magnitude of the uh, distance vector is 0 0.4 meters, right? Dist magnitude just is length. And then the length of the other vector is 50 newtons, and then we're going to do sine of 30 degrees, because that's the angle between them. So it's just going to be 0.4 times 50 times sine of 30 degrees, which gives us exactly 10 newton meters. Okay? Okay, so very simply, that is torque and work. And hopefully you see the difference between the two of them. If you've taken physics before, really work is a dot product and torque is a cross product. It just so happens to be when your, your torque is applied 90 degrees to your force, basically torque can just be expressed as distance times force. And for work, when the work is applied in the same direction, or the force is applied in the same direction as the um, displacement, it just ends up being force times displacement. So 
in physics, you probably do the sort of the simple version of these two, but there's this is a little bit more behind the scenes. Okay, so you'll see the another um, application of cross product, and this is actually a pretty useful one for geometry and stuff like that, is to find an area of a parallelogram. And you'll notice the area of a parallelogram is just equal to a cross b. What does that mean? Or the magnitude of a cross b. So to illustrate this, let's go straight to an example. Here's our example. Determine the area of the parallelogram created by the vectors below. So I said the area is just a cross b. And more specifically, it's the magnitude, because area is just a number, right? So a cross b is going to give us a vector. We just want to know the, the magnitude of that. So if we're given two vectors here, what do I mean by the parallelogram? Well, these are two vectors here, but if I repeat those two vectors, like I'm, I repeat another b there and I repeat another a here, do you see how it makes a parallelogram? I can probably draw that a little bit better because this one should be parallel, right? Because vectors have to be parallel and this one should be a little bit longer. So something like that. Do you see that parallelogram? Hopefully you do. And a cool fact is that the area of that parallelogram is just vector A crossed with vector B. Sort of interesting. So before we do that, we should probably know what A and B are. So A in this case is, um, what is it? What's the vector? So I'm going to write it in component form. The vector is 1, 2, right? The x component is 1, the y, the y component is 2. And vector b is 4, 3, right? The x component is 4, the y component is 3. Okay, so let's pick the cross product of these. But hold on. You should remember something about cross product. These are 2D vectors. Can you do cross product with 2D vectors? The answer is no, you can't do cross product with 2D vectors. So how does this make any sense? Well, we can actually still do it. And the, the way we do it is we sort of cheat. We pretend that this parallelogram is in 3D space. It's just on the flat surface. So pretend you're looking at a plane. So I'm just going to sketch here. Here's our X, our Y and our z in 3D space, right? Let's call this x, let's call this y, let's call this z. Picture the xy plane just being sort of this flat plane here that's lying down and x and z is sticking straight out of it. Now it's a little bit hard to see. Let's use yellow, right? So that flat plane there is the xy plane. Let's just pretend that our two vectors that we just did, a and b, are on that flat plane. So there's our two vectors or whatever are on that flat plane. If we do that, what would the z component of those vectors be? Well, the z component of those vectors would just be zero, right? Because it goes zero in the z direction. And that's exactly what we do here to find the area of this parallelogram. We actually trick it and just make the z part z, uh, zero, sorry make that blue. So let's do 4, 3, 0. So now we have 3D vectors that we can do cross product with. Okay, so we can do our cross product. I'm just going to do this quickly off to the side. So 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 4, 3, 0, 4, 3. We cross up the first one. So A cross B, I'm just going to do it here, is going to be 2 times 0 minus 0. So 0. 0 times 4 minus so 0. And then 1 times 3, which is 3, minus 2 times 4, so minus 8. So 3 minus 8, which is negative 5. Now, you'll notice if you do this sort of with any, with any vectors, those first two will always be 0. You can think about why that is um, yourself. But what we're looking for is not the vector answer. We're looking for the magnitude, because the magnitude is actually what the area is equal to. So what's the magnitude of that vector? Well, we know if the zero is in the x direction, zero is in the y direction, negative five is in the z direction, the only the, the length of that vector is going to be five, right? Because it's just five in that z direction. You could also do this by doing like the x squared plus y squared plus z squared, take the square, square root, but you'll see it'll just come out to five. 
So the magnitude is just equal to 5. Okay? So what this does is actually takes a pretty complicated question. Like if we tried to figure this area out ourselves um, using some geometry and stuff like that, it can get pretty complicated. But if you know how to take the cross product, it sort of simplifies the process a lot. And you'll see, so that works with any two vectors, and that also does work in 3D space. So if these vectors um, that define our, paral our parallelogram are in 3D space, the same thing works. You just wouldn't have the zero down here. You wouldn't have to insert that. You only have to insert that when you're given a flat um, parallelogram that's a 2D parallelogram. So the other, the other part of this is the area of a triangle is just a half times the cross product of A and B. So we had this A and B here, right? This A and this B, and we found the area of the parallelogram. But notice how you can also make this into just a triangle, right? A triangle between any two vectors, if you just join the tips of those two vectors, it'll make a triangle. And the area of the triangle is always just going to be half the area of the parallelogram, right? It's like you're cutting it in half. So you don't really need to memorize a separate formula for this. It's just half of that area of the parallelogram. So the area of the triangle is just one half a cross b. In this case, we already calculated the magnitude of a cross b as five. So essentially it's just five over two or 2.5. And that'll be units squared, whatever units these are. Okay. So that's sort of interesting that cross product has that application. Notice how cross product will change depending on what the angle between them is and stuff like that. And you can always think of it, if the, if the angle increases between the two of them, you're going to have a larger area. And that's why the cross product increases, right? If you have two vectors that are very close together like that, the area is going to be very small. But if you take those two vectors and you open them up like this, the parallelogram is going to have a very large area. So that's why if you have a big angle between the two vectors, your cross product ends up being larger than the, if the two vectors are small, okay? Okay, a little piece of information I forgot, I didn't mention yet, because um, this is something we already know, but I just want to draw your attention to it now. Another good use of the dot product is that it equals zero if the, de the vectors are perpendicular to each other, or orthogonal is the sort of the more generic word we use for perpendicular in 3D space. So if they're at 90 degrees to each other, the dot product of those two ve vectors will be zero. And if we want to check if two vectors are collinear or in the same direction, the cross product can tell us that if they're zero. Right? Now there is a third check that you can do which combines these two facts and that's called the triple scalar product and you'll see that at the bottom of the page. If you do A cross B and then dot that with C, if A, B, and C are any three vectors in 3D space, if that equals zero, that means the three vectors are on the same plane. And there's actually a mistake here. These should be brackets, not absolute value. It's not the magnitude. It's just you do A cross B, you get a vector out of that, and then you dot that vector with the C vector. If that comes up to zero, the three vectors are coplanar. And what we mean by coplanar again is if, so let's sketch, let's sketch a 3D axis here. If I have A and B that are, for example, on this XY plane, so this is A and B, let's pretend they're flat on that XY plane, if this is X and this is Y and this is Z. We know any two vectors, or two, two vectors can be coplanar with each other, they can always form a plane, but a third vector, if that is also on the same plane, so it's also on that XY plane, if you do the triple scalar product with those three vectors, it should come out to zero. And it actually doesn't matter which order you do it in. You could do A cross C and then dot that with B, or you know, you can mix up the order however you want. It should always come up to zero if they're coplanar. If they're not, if, if C, for example, is like up in the air, I'm gonna draw with like a little shadow here on that axis, then that triple scalar product will not come up to zero. I want you to think about why that is. There's a very good reason for why that is. And to, to think about it, I want you to think about these facts here, right? This fact here and this fact here. And remember, a cross product finds a perpendicular vector to two vectors. And the last little piece of information that's along the same lines 
is that the triple scalar product, what it also equals is the area or the volume of a 3D parallel pipette. And what a 3D a parallel pipette is, it's like sort of like a rectangular prism in three dimensions, but it's a little bit more of a general one where the top can be shifted. So you'll notice for this, this shape here, it's like, it sort of looks like a rhombus in three dimensions, right? The volume of that shape is just equal to the triple scalar product of the three vectors that form the three edges of that shape. Sort of interesting. So if you do the triple scalar product, you do A cross B and then dot it with C, it will tell you the volume of that parallel of pipette. So that's, these last two are just sort of some bonus information that could possibly help you out on um, some stuff you do in the future. I'm not gonna lie, this will not be on the exam, these two things, but they may help you out. So I'm putting them here for reference.